You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, uh, and I have a very special guest today. We have Bryson Pede. He actually had a really cool thing happen to him a couple weeks ago. He won the Kerr Reservoir Shenandoah Division BFL, which, and again, like I just want you to kind of tell the story about how this all took place, but it was a little bit of a grind out there compared to other years, wasn't it? Yeah, um, for sure. And I think you know, we'll touch on a lot of things, but I was, you know, leading up to that event, I was working a weird schedule at work where I was working Tuesday to Saturday. So I'm kind of a, a tournament junkie. I like to fish like every weekend. So I wasn't able to fish many tournaments, but you know, with that being said, I was on the water Sunday and Monday pretty much for a month leading up to that. So, you know, I'd kind of heard the lake you know, was fishing tough after that cold front that came through. But, you know, I was kind of thinking about it a couple of days after the event. And I was like, man, I didn't get to practice like any that week leading up to it. And it just seems like when it gets like that and you have a lot of history on a lake, it's like sometimes no practice can be the best practice, honestly. It, it really is weird when you live right on a lake. I don't know how certain people do it. Like uh, up up where I am in Northern Virginia, we have a guy called uh, Mr. Uh, Matthew McCluskey. He, he does extremely well on a lake near here. And I've always found it fascinating because it's so hard if it's a place that you go every day to, to keep it competitive and not just fish history. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I struggled with that for the longest time. And uh, I mean, obviously still do it at some times, but like it definitely paid off Saturday. Um, even just like running down the lake, it's like anywhere you think like, oh, I've caught a bass there. You, your instinct is like, all right, let me pull in there and make some casts. But I mean, you'll kill yourself running around all day fishing like that. You got to kind of just go with the flow and kind of take with, you know, what the day's giving you and just react off of that. And, and really to set the stage for everyone, I mean, we were talking a little bit beforehand, let's kind of go back so we can kind of go forward. Um, looking at your, uh, your BFL stats, you fished a little bit in college, correct? I did. Yeah. Uh, like we were saying, I fished at, uh, ECU, East Carolina university in Greenville. Um, you know, was fortunate to meet some guys my freshman year there that, uh, me and my buddy, we were both kind of looking to get into it, and we uh, fished with uh, – we both ended up linking up with different partners and traveling together. So it was definitely a good way to start kind of traveling and fishing new places. Um, and like I said, I really – I wasn't that – I was into it, but it wasn't like something I was committed to. Like, you know, if I were to go back and do it now, obviously the goal would be, hey, let me qualify for the Nationals and, uh, you know, fish the classic bracket in that whole deal, but that kind of wasn't even a fault at the time. Yeah. And it's so hard. And we're talking about it. Like it's, there's fantastic opportunities now in high school and college for, for young anglers. Absolutely. But a little caveat, it still needs this thing called the monies. Uh, even though some of these tournaments aren't, they're not, they're free, but then you still got to pay for room and board, depending on what college you go to. You know, I was at Shenandoah university and I basically flipped the bill for any tournaments. Um, and I know if you go to bigger universities, they help out a little bit. But the point is, guys, when you're going to college, it's not just completely sunshine and rainbows and they just throw boats at you like Oprah giving away free cars. It's not right. how, it, how it is at all. Yeah. So after college, what what transpired to get you to where you are today? Um, I definitely would have to like give a big shout out to like anybody I shared a boat with, like leading up to that time, I learned something from, um, you know, I, my first partner, Jonathan Jones, he kind of got me into the whole tournament deal. He was, uh, you know, we met through, uh, my half brother and he one day, you know, he knew I liked to fish. He was like, Hey, you know, fish this tournament trail with me. And I want to say that was, <clears throat> man 2017 2018 no it was probably earlier than that it was 2015 and um you know so i fished in his boat with him uh in the tournaments and you know we did pretty good in some not so good in others but uh we ended up finishing like third that year in the uh, championship for that trail and it kind of just like lit a fire i was like all right like 
you know, winning money is fun. Bass fishing is fun. So like, you know, oh, there goes some light. Hold on. <laughs> but yeah, like it was like, all right, if I'm going to do this. So that's kind of where that all started. So you got your first boat. And then I, I guess the better question to ask is Kerr your home water. Would you consider that? I kind of call it that now but like really i uh you know where like raleigh is raleigh durham north carolina um mm-hmm. i grew up probably 20 minutes from falls lake okay um so like a lot of people you know the major league fishing came a handful of years ago to falls jordan harris and it kind of publicized those lakes greatly and um but yeah, I mean, they're definitely hidden gems before then. And so I would say like Falls Lake is kind of where I started fishing and, uh, Car Lake, Bugs Island was a close second. And now, you know, I was only 45, 50 minutes from here to begin with. And we've, my family has been coming up here for a long time and we all kind of just moved up here in the last year and a half. So yeah, you're really blessed. And for the guys that are actually watching on YouTube, I have Google Earth up to say, like, if you're in the Raleigh area, you have so many cool places that you can fish compared to some places in Virginia where it's like a two hour drive to get to a lake. And it looks like you could walk <laughs> to a couple places. That yeah, is so cool. I mean, that was just a handful. I mean, you've got like Falls, Jordan, Harris, you know, you go northwest, you've got Heiko and Mayo, a um, couple of smaller lakes, but they're still fantastic fisheries um and then obviously gaston you know right behind bugs so yeah i mean it's a really kind of an overlooked area i know the tennessee river in the southeast obviously gets all the attention but we've definitely got some tremendous fisheries around here i mean that is the one benefit i will say to major league fishing though is that they did bring a little bit of awareness i know you guys probably didn't like it but honestly until they went there i didn't know about all these lakes I, I didn't know like the Carolinas had such an abundance of fisheries. Yeah. And I mean, they're so diverse, like, you know, even falls falls is really like two lakes in one. Cause you've got, you know, a shallow flat stumpy upper end, like on the wider part up there. And then the lower end of the lake to the dam is like a winding narrow, deeper, clear section. And then, you know, you've got a river ledge that runs through the upper end, and it's like, you know, I've heard people wow. compare it to like a mini pickwick. It's just got a lot more stumps and whatnot. But, yeah, it definitely made me better fishing there. So this is probably where you honed your craft? Was was it lakes like this? I would say so, yeah. Um, but I just, you know, Bugs Island is, to me, like, I learned to do so much more as far as, like, technique-wise here. Um, you know, and adjustments like obviously this is a flood control lake so like you're constantly having to deal with that opposed to like going downstream to gaston you know that's regulated which is why we're flood control so like you have to deal with changing conditions every week so a lot of times you can just throw practice out the door yeah and for 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 the people that are listening my maryland audience that hasn't been down there what he means by flood control is i and you can always um you can correct me if i'm wrong it's the first lake in a chain of lakes starting with gaston uh, it starts with kerr gaston and the roanoke rapids and this is controlled by the army corps of engineers and they use this for flood control meaning that the the water will fluctuate a lot um it's not very consistent like a smith mountain lake example near us is that is that about right yeah, I mean, you pretty much, you know, hit the nail on the head. Like, I've seen this lake. Uh, I've fished it at, like, 310, which is, like, you, you can literally flip picnic tables in, like, uh, parking lots. And I've also seen it at 294. And that's just me personally. You know, I'm only 26 years old. I know people have seen it a lot higher and a lot lower. But, uh, yeah, and, like, we'll get into that as well, like, when they pull the water down really low in the winter. But that's a really good way to uh, expand your knowledge out here for sure. Yeah, I mean, getting into to dealing with those conditions, it is interesting. And I would assume it's a little different than the TVA system, which pulls water for power and electric. Like, can you time it or is it just random what the water levels will be at any given time? Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it's always changing. Like I, this spring, you know, I heard they wanted to keep the uh, the water at like 298 or something. And it was like, 
you know, through February and early March, like the war, it was frustrating because I've got stuff that they really get on this time of year. Um, you know, some of the type stuff I actually called them on in that BFL, but it was like, all right, heading out here to fish, you know, the water came up to 300 and then they, you know, they yank it back down to 296, 297. And this time of year, those fish, obviously they don't like the water getting pulled off their head like that. So they're going to, they're going to move from those areas. How much do the fish on, on Kerr move, or maybe there's a better way of saying it. Are, are they used to the water fluctuation? Does it bother them as much as let's say a, a, a stable lake that doesn't have that consistent change happening? I would say so. Um, and I, I don't even want to claim to be an expert on, you know, cause I still struggle with it, but a lot of the guys gripe, like when they come up here from out of town and they get on like an amazing bush flipping bite. And then within two days, they pulled it down six, eight inches, maybe even a foot and all that stuff's dry. And now you're scrambling, trying to figure out where your fish went. Um, but yeah, I mean, they definitely, I think will move a lot and that's kind of time of year dependent as well. Cause we have blue back herring. So those fish can get real nomadic, like, and just be all over the place, which is another thing I'm still trying to figure out. Those things can be a blessing and a curse. <laughs> We got a couple of lakes up here that got them in there and everyone's like, there's, there's not a damn bass in this lake. And it's like, well, if you have forward facing sonar, you'll find them and then, and, and you'll smoke them. But yeah, it's so weird how they can change the topography of a place. And I remember rumors when I was maybe in college and we go down there for, um, fishers of men and there were blueback in there. Like how, I guess bad is not the word. Can you feel the presence of the blueback now? Is there a decent blueback bite? Yeah, for sure. Like, I think this year it was, or this past year, excuse me, it was like you could find that bite until late summer. Like, I mean, you could pull up on a clay bank or point and a foot of water and, you know, you got fish wolf packing. And I mean, it started in like May and just when you thought it was going to end, like it just kept going. Like I, most guys think, oh, it's like July, August, like dog days. I got to get out here way off a point and drag a Carolina rig or throw a drop shot. But like in all reality, people were winning tournaments with 18 pounds, maybe more like fishing in the dirt. And I know, you know, the same thing can be said in 50 foot of water, like with wolf pack fish, you know, suspended. But, you know, I'm still trying to figure that dial in that bite a little bit that time of year. I'm I'm wondering if that's just going to get better as the blue back become more prevalent in this lake. I mean, I don't know if it'll ever be like a Lake Murray or Hartwell, but I'm assuming it'll get better as there's a higher density of blue back in there. Yeah, it definitely could. I mean, I remember pulling up on places, you know, this past summer or, you know, late spring and like slinging a spinner bait or a mag draft and just they bump your bait all the way back to the boat and you'd, you know, in the clear end, like down in Nutbush, we fished in places where you had just a bunch of bluebacks just follow your bait in every cast. So, I mean, they're definitely, I think they're thriving. Now, this this time of year, uh, just, just for Kerr, just in for the generic stuff, do you think the thing that gives people the most fit about going down there is the water fluctuation and how to deal with that? Because when I was a kid... It, Everyone always talks about the bushes, but I feel like that is just a, a absolute lottery ticket if it's ever in the bushes because because it, it never is. It seems like when you need it to be, and is it about just anticipating and knowing where to go when the water is at this level, and then where to go when it's at this level? Because it sounds like almost tidal in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of similarities. Um, I still struggle with it myself, but like, yeah, it's like. Last year, I, I was actually talking to a buddy of mine about it. I was like, man, I don't feel like I flipped any bushes up here at all, like last year. Like, I just never got on that bite. Maybe it got up and happened, like, during the week when I was working. But And then, like, I think back to, like, COVID year, like, when they canceled a bunch of tournaments and, like, we were having some, some little jackpot tournaments, like a guy I know right by the house. And it seemed like the water stayed at, like, 303 plus or right in that range for like a month or two like in you know late april may when you want it to be but it's definitely a fine line you know like it can be good at 302 but like you get it like 305 306 plus it really can get way back in some places and spread those fish out 
Yeah, it is fascinating, and I'm and and, and we'll we'll get. To, I guess we'll hold that question to later because we'll we'll get to that one because um, I think it's going to be interesting when the uh, when the Bassmasters uh, the they come here in two and a half months and some change. But so going into this tournament, and when I have winners on and people that do well, I I really like to get into their head a little bit because I feel like it's not just the spot, but it's the decisions. The decisions is what makes you, makes you win or makes you lose. And so going into this, like you said, you took some time off and that probably wasn't mentally put you in the best headspace going into it on Saturday. Correct. Yeah. And I think it was kind of twofold. Like, yeah, I didn't fish a tournament for a month, but like at the same time, I, like I was chomping at the bit, like the weekend before they actually had a cat trail up here scheduled for Sunday and we actually got snow, and they ended up canceling that tournament at like 8, 8.30 the night before. And honestly, I, like, I was kind of pissed because I had the boat hooked up. I had been working on Saturdays. Like, I was ready to go. And I ended up going anyway. Like I went out there in the snow and sleep for like six hours because I was like, well, I'm going to fish that BFL next weekend. So I'm <laughs> So you, so you get there Saturday Saturday morning, did, and you didn't do anything on Friday, correct? So it's just you're going for it on Saturday. Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, you know, I worked Monday through Friday that week, and really was like, hey, I'll I'll dump the boat in and see what the water temperature is, and you know, plan to start down in Nutbush and just adjust based off that. It seemed like you're pretty chill. You weren't too stressed going into this tournament. No, which is funny because, like, I don't know. I, it was only the third BFL I've ever fished, and, you know, I was just ready to go, man. Like, I, one of my team partners, uh, Mike Corbishley, he actually fishes the MPFL now, and he had just gotten back from Pickwick, and he, he had a third-place finish. So I was, like, super pumped up for him, and – was talking to him and I was like, yeah, man, I'm going to jump in this BFL up here at Bugs. He was like, man, heck yeah, go win that thing. And I was just like, yeah, I plan on it. Like, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. Not like trying to be cocky, but just kind of like, I was almost like halfway serious. Like, yeah, yeah. obviously like, you know, you, that's why I go up, like you want to win, but it's just kind of funny how that all worked out. So you get into the tournament, you get to your first spot, like, and, and, and when did you catch your first fish, your first keeper of the day? Um, I want to say it was like nine o'clock. Um, yeah, that's not bad. <clears throat> so I kind of, I was waiting to see what, what boat number I got. Um, I was like, if I get one through 10, you know, I was going to start right there around the ramp, like probably go back in, in the Creek behind the ramp and, you know, I, I got the text, I was boat 82 and I was like, all right. And there was also, there was three other tournaments that I know of going on that day. Uh, there was a team tournament out of Fleming town Creek, which is a nut bush. Um, Fishers of men was out of Henderson point also in nut bush. And then they had a five alive out of Clarksville, Okanichi ramp. So I was in my head, I'm like, all right, I mean, most of the community stuff, good places to pull up and catch one, you know, they'll probably be covered up. So I said, I'll just start on what I can get on, you know, if there's anything good. So I, I pull in one like main lake bank. Cause I went down to nut bush and a couple weeks ago and I, I caught a few fish, nothing great, but they were the right ones. So I said, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I ran like three or four really good places. I was able to get on what I wanted to and just never got a bite. And I could tell I was kind of like fishing fast because I wanted to get out of that clear water. I'm just not a huge fan of it this time of year. So I so kind of pulled stressed. the plug okay. on Nutbush at like nine o'clock. Interesting. Okay. Made a move. I wouldn't say stress, but just like uh, I'm ready to get kind of in my comfort zone. Your gut was off. You just didn't feel, it didn't feel right. Pretty much. Yeah. Like. I, this time of year, I, I pull the trolling motor up a lot. I move a lot. And I feel like on this lake, like if you're not getting bit, you just got to keep moving. What about the clear water? Now, is this a, gen, a general thing with you? Is like you just don't like clear water at all? Or is it just a cur thing that you don't like clear water? I mean, going back to like growing up fishing falls, kind of when I started fishing, like falls 
can get really stained and i grew up fishing the upper end of falls so i'm just used to fishing dirtier water in the spring i mean i like fishing offshore i also like fishing shallow when i'm fishing shallow like i want i want the water to be a little bit dirty um gotcha. so that's pretty much the deal with that okay that makes sense that makes a lot of sense How, and you said there was a couple of tournaments going out of there at the same time correct Yeah, there was four tournaments on that lake that day, just Holy. that I know of. There may have been more with, like, club tournaments and whatnot. So, Holy shit. I mean, the other three team tournaments, they, yeah, they didn't draw as many boats as I thought they would. But, I mean, there was still probably at least 250 tournament boats on the Holy lake. Holy crap. <laughs> Man, that sounds like a Jersey turnpike. But, I mean, you'd be, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised, though, how well that lake kind of holds and hides that many boats because i mean i i was in some areas at times where i thought there would be wrapped up in boats and i really didn't see that many people i'm used to just fishing so much tidal where it is like a freaking parking lot on the key spots and you are bumper to bumper so it's so crazy when you get onto these smiths and these curves and it's like it absorbs so many of them and it, it is weird it is really weird as a river rat so you go from clear water, you make your move. How far of a run are you making? Are you going all the way to the Roanoke River, so to speak, or is it just a quick run up to some more stained water? Fairly quick. Like okay. I ran up out of Nutbush, like through the cut through at the islands and um, just kind of ran up some more. And I wanted to pull in a pocket and like I'm the type of guy that just, I don't like fishing in a crowd or I really don't like fishing around anybody. I like to kind of get away and, I pulled by this pocket and there was two boats in there and I, I wanted to get in there and there was one boat like towards the back and one boat fishing like a really good little secondary and a little stretch of bank that I like. So I, I told my co, I said, Hey man, we're going to pull up like on the main lake point leading into this pocket. I'm going to see what that boat in the back does. Cause I just had a feeling they pulled in there and blew through some stuff and we're going to leave. And they ended up leaving in like five minutes. So I pulled in right behind them and that's i actually ended up catching my first two keepers right back there okay so now it's about it's about nine ten o'clock you got two in the boat you need three more so that's got to settle you down a little bit yeah for sure like <clears throat> i don't i try not to get too rattled anymore but you know catching your first one you know it's always nice like i want to put one in the box and like they were just two pounders i think one was like a 189 and one was like a a 220 something but like i caught those two within like five minutes and it just calmed me down completely and uh yeah so i kind of fished in that area i actually fished a stretch and then went right back to where i caught those two gave it another 10 minutes or so and then ended up making another move so you got so you got how much weight at this point yeah i mean i got like two for for four pounds or so um wow. <clears throat> uh, made another move after that like i probably ran not that far i mean a couple miles and i pulled into a creek and this is kind of like where i did most of my damage like probably within a 45 minute window uh it was really between 10 and 11 is when it really went down i upgraded one time after that but yeah uh, it's crazy how those bite windows are why do you think that happened then? Is it just, was it a rotation that you were planning on or, or what was it? I mean, I do have like kind of some milk runs, you could call it up here. Um, and I just decided to start in that Creek in particular. I do think the wind was blowing into it and that Creek in particular is typically a little clearer than the ones around it. But if you get the right wind blowing in there this time of year for a few days, it can, get the water a little stained and when it does it just seems like i can catch them real good on the crankbait in there so yeah i, I pulled in there and pulled up to a place like a <clears throat> kind of a little sneaky deal like going back to the water being low in the winter like it was something i found when the lake was down it was a secondary point with a rock vein running off of it and like the water being 300 right now it looks so clean like nobody is ever going to pull up on it because they're just like oh it's just a little rounded point but there's a rock vein that runs uh... you know it starts a little bit off the point and runs into the mouth of like that pocket 
so it's perfect for like that cold front that came through. Yeah, and that's something again, you know, and I've talked about where that's where having that that local advantage does help when you've been there and you can see the lake at all these different levels. Because that is a sneaky deal that unless you're there or putting time on the water, you're not gonna you're not gonna probably find that place. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think I was just fishing through that creek one day when it was down and I was on the trolling motor. And you know, typically when the lake's down that low in the winter, it's pretty clear around there. And I that's smart. I saw the rocks and marked them. I was like, Yeah, this is pay off one day do, do you do you mark them or do you take pictures on your phone to have it for later when, when it's low like that uh, i just mark them like i'll troll all the way up to them and mark them and like now with ford facing sonar like i i run active target so it, it just makes it more efficient okay. and like i'm not when i'm fishing that depth it's not like i'm pulling up there and like scoping fish like oh i see one on this rock vein i'm pretty much using it to like all right i'm on 80 foot i can see where that rock vein starts and i fire a cast up there like i know i can hit it first cast with a crankbait jig whatever now i'm assuming these fish were not blueback fish were they were they just staging for the pre-spawn then and weren't chasing bait yeah i think so um they're actually like these fish get shallow pretty early up here and there had been a wave of fish up shallow like in early mid February. And so like I knew there was big ones up and I knew there was probably another wave that came up. And uh, I just think that's the kind of stuff that really plays when you get these 20 something degree nights for a couple nights in a row. It's like they don't have to swim hundreds of yards back out to deep water. Like they can pull right to this rock or stump and just kind of chill and you know just try to stay warm and wait for a meal to come by and and we'll definitely that that's so fascinating because i've always thought about like the bluff walls and how and like how you find good ones and i think what's interesting now is with forward facing sonar how that probably alleviates the learning curve where you can go buy some of these things you can scan it real quick and know real and i'm talking more practice guys by the way not not in a tournament to figure out which spots are actually going to be the juice um how long have you had forward facing sonar and just, just more of like your skill set with it. Are you, are you still learning it or do you feel like that's a, a good part of your game? Um, it's definitely like improved my game tremendously, uh, especially like in the summer, but yeah, I've been running it not, not two years, maybe a year and a half. Um, like I said, my, one of my team partners, Mike Corbusley, he actually works for Lawrence Navico. So he kind of, got me going with that and like i ran his blazer in the uh aba nationals up here a couple years ago and he had like four 12 lives on his boat with active target and i had never used a setup like that and i was like holy cow like this is legit wow that's uh damn that's more expensive than my house (laughs) that's pretty cool Uh, like after that week After just a week of using it, then I felt like uh, just using it that one week, I got super dialed in with it because that was an October tournament and I was fishing brush and stuff with it. So now like, and honestly, like on my Triton right now, I'm only running two non carbons. So I've got it up on the front graph flush mounted in the, in the uh, dash panel with a map split, you know, a couple inches and the rest is active target, but I'm going to upgrade, you know, and put some bigger graphs on there. But yeah, it's definitely... I'm not like a, I wouldn't call it like video game fishing. I'd use it as a tool, you know, uh, confidence. I know I'm casting on structure or, you know, seeing fish, but I'm not one to like the Mickey rig fish or whatever else at this point. Uh, not saying I never will, but it, it, it's something that I want to, exp- I want to improve my game on right now. I think I'm going to go out a lot more in fun fish and just practice with it just so I can learn when to use it versus when not to use it. Um, you know, with that said, were, were most of the fish that you caught, did you see them on the graph or not? No, no, no not really. Um, most of the time, I, I really wasn't even using it. I wasn't looking at it. I mean, there was times where, because it was blowing, like the wind was blowing hard out of the west. So there was times like where the boat was spinning and I would pan around and just make sure you know, I'm seeing that rock or stump or whatever I wanted to throw at, but no, it, I, I wouldn't say it was like that, that much in play on Saturday. Okay. That makes sense. And and then, so from there, you catch most of your weight between 10 and 11. Do you have any more, any more upgrades throughout the day? 
Yeah, and I guess I'll touch base on like that little flurry. So like I pulled up on that rock vein and um you know, I started way off of it cuz the wind was blowing on it and I bombed a cast up there and I mean, I got like probably 3 3 real turns in and it just stopped. Dude, and uh that's you awesome. know, it was like a split second it, it feels like it's hung. And my co like actually said something before I said anything. He was like, "You got a fish?" and I was like, "Yeah, I think it's a good one." And that ended up being like a three pounder roughly. So I was like, all right, sweet. Like I got three now. I got one I can weigh, take the weigh in. And so I weigh the fish, you know, throw it in the box, get lined back up. And I, it wasn't like the next cast, but I kind of got on a different angle on that same rock vein. And uh, the wind was blowing me kind of close to it. So I fire up there. And I'm throwing like a, a medium diving crankbait and it's like ticking down the rock vein. And you know, when you get to like where your crankbait is, it, as deep as this going to go and it's just about to rise yeah. back up to the boat. Like before it got to that point, it ticked the rock vein and just stopped. And like I, that time I legitimately thought I was hung and then it started moving and I was like, yeah, I got a good one. Oh my gosh. Dude. So, uh, yeah and that fish man i didn't know it was as big as it was and it <clears throat> i hadn't caught a fish over five pounds up here yet this spring and I, it was funny like i told some buddies like man i just need like a four or five pounder in this bfl so it takes me you know down beside the boat and it actually comes up like beside the big motor just for a split second enough for me to see how big it was and uh i was like wow and then it just took off like tore off peel and drag like if my drag wasn't set that fish would have broke me off and uh i don't even know what i said after that i think i just told my i kept telling my co like please net this fish please net this fish <laughs> and uh man i would have i would have paid a hundred dollars to have a gopro running i wish oh i did because i was probably like i was probably going great but um yeah, I mean, he was awesome. He was the man with the net, and he netted that fish. And, like, I was like, man, that's over five. And at that point, that put me at, like, four for 12 and change. And I was like, okay, like, it's still 1030. Like, I've got a shot with this fish. I just need to put my head down and grind it out. Does that make it, does that make it easier or harder? Because it, in one sense, you're like, I just got to catch one. But then you can almost hammer down on yourself like, oh, shit. I cannot mess this up. It was kind of both. And it's funny because like I was pretty serious, like all morning leading up to that. Like I, I was just focused, like my, the wheels were turning. I was trying to figure out what was going on and I wasn't talking a lot. And I think after I've caught that fish and put it in the box, me and my co-angler probably chatted for like an hour straight. Like I wouldn't shut up because I was just like, <laughs> it just put me in a good mood. I told him, I was like, man, that gives me so much confidence mm -hmm. to just lock this crankbait in my hand for the rest of the day. Cause like, it was like, bam, bam. I caught two, a three and a five and a half pretty much in 10 minutes. And I was like, yeah, this is what we're doing for the rest of the day. Wow. And that's the thing too, though. It, it's, it, unless you've experienced it, it is the best drug on the planet when something like that happens to you in the middle of a day. It, 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 it is, it's better than anything that you could possibly put into your body it's such a high and it does calm you down to a little bit where it's like that was the hardest part and it's over and it's nice when it happens earlier in the day too to where then you can really rethink it I, but though it's burnt me before in the past where i'm like oh shit and then as the time wears on and you don't catch that fit then you're like what the hell am i doing and i was fortunate because like you know i, I pulled around to like right near that, I've got like a just a do nothing. I don't want to call it a do nothing bank because it's a clay bank, which can be phenomenal this time of year. But it's just like a flat bank. But it's another one of those deals where there, there's two like isolated rock piles on that bank, probably ten yards off the bank, probably the size of your front the front deck of your boat. Uh, they've both got like a, a stump on them, and I I want to say I pulled up there caught just a small keeper and my co caught one I was like all right sweet and at that point i remember 
telling my co, I was like, man, they are, uh, it just seems like they're like biting, biting today. Like it's going to be good. I'm like, I wasn't trying to sandbag in that tournament. Like when I'm catching them, I just feel like everybody's catching them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We're so negative on ourselves when it's like, if we're catching them, clearly everyone, it's not that we just figured it out. (laughs) Yeah. So that was kind of my train of thought. So, but anyway, like, so I had five at that point and I kind of worked down that stretch and I get to the little shallow point and like the wind's blowing on all the stuff. So I just keep fishing it cause I'm getting bites and I bomb another cast up there, same crankbait and catch like a two and a half. So at this point it's probably 11 and I've got like, <clears throat> I want to say I had 1470 something. So like really, I think second place Saturday was like 14, nine. So I may have had that tournament won at that point at like 10, 30, 11, but I had no idea. Yeah, I have it up right now. So yeah, you had it. Second place had 1409. Third place had 1405. That's dude. That's freaking awesome. Like when you got into the way in, when did you know? Um, so it was funny, like I pulled into the no wake zone and like we can go back because I uh, upgraded some more, but like oh, we'll hit on that. But like anyway, like skip through some of that. Like I told my co, you know, I had a good bag and I said, and he ended up with a good bag, which we'll get into that. But like, I was like, dude, we're, we're going in early. Um, not that early. Like I just wanted to ease in, give time. So I idle in and, uh, my one of my buddies tyler uh trent you probably have heard his name because he wins up here all the time um but like i i gave him like the thumbs up thumbs down he gave me a thumbs down and to me i'm thinking all right his thumbs down he's probably got like 16 and uh anyway it was just funny because like i got in the line to get my bag and he ended up being the one to dump his fish and like hand me his bag and he told me he had like 10 something. He was like, man, cause I told him what I thought I had. He was like, if you got close to 18, he said, you're going to win today. And I was like in denial. I was like, no, nah, man, <laughs> like no way. <laughs> yep. And he, he's just like, yeah, trust me. I fished enough of these to know like that's going to win today. He said, and he was like second place is like 14 right now. And that's when I was like, oh shit. Like I really might have a shot. Dude. Dude, that is it is so surreal when you win something like this and you go into full denial mode immediately. Like, there's no way in hell somebody else has got something. It especially depends on if you get to weigh in last, it's nice, versus if you have to weigh in first and have to deal with every single person going across that stage. But I don't know. It's whether it's the Bassmaster Classic or, or your first BFL or whatever, it's such a cool moment. It really is. Now you said your co angler also had a pretty good day. Yeah, he actually finished second place on the coast side. Um, wow. So he, he ended up catching some fish behind me, uh, throwing a shaky head. And, you know, I would pull up to places and, you know, like I, I'm not like trying to backboat the guy, but like obviously, you know, I get my first cast on places and the wind ends up blowing the boat around. But like he was a phenomenal fisherman. He, he was doing work with that shaky head. And uh, actually, so – Going back to, like, catching my fifth one in Cullen, like, we hit another place after that, and it was kind of – I was expecting to catch, a, like, a three-pounder there. It's like a one of those one-fish deals sometimes, and I pull up, and he actually catches a three-pounder, wow. like, when we were about to leave. And I was like, all right, let me just kind of fit this for, like, five more minutes. And, uh, and then I catch, a, like, a three-and-a-quarter right after him. So, like, we at this point, like, we're having a good time, like, high-fiving, and he's got, like, three or four in the box, I think maybe four. And so that put me up to, like, 16-something at that point. Dude, I mean, like, when it, when it's your time, it's your time. And that's what's just that's what's so cool about this. Now, are, are, you, are you planning now to, to fish the rest of the Shenandoah division? What are your plans for the rest of the year? Yeah, so that's where, like, this whole thing kind of comes full circle because, like, I've 
I've been like wanting to travel and fish new places. Like I've, I fish falls all the time. I fish Jordan a little bit. I fish here a lot. And like, I've been wanting to get out of my comfort zone. I got some buddies that do like the traveling deal that have fished mm-hmm. the ABA top one fifties, the Toyotas, the NPFL, but like, you know, I, I don't know if I'm ready, maybe not, but like definitely like from a financial standpoint, like I'm not ready to do any of that because I haven't I don't have much experience traveling aside from college so like to start the year I was like I need to do some BFLs for a couple of years so I looked at the divisions and nothing really I didn't love any of it and there was so much local stuff and like big tournaments here I said I'll just do that deal again and maybe do the BFLs next year <clears throat> but if there was one division like before the year that I would have looked at and said like that's not the one I would do. It would have been the Shenandoah. Really? Why? Just because, like, it's the lakes are the furthest away, and, you know, Potomac twice, James River, Smith Mountain, all places that – I've been to the James before. I haven't been to Potomac or Smith. So it's like – it was just funny how it worked out because, yeah, like now I'm committed, like I'm going to fish all of them because, you know, I've won so I can go to the regional. I think you have to fish one more and at least pay for the rest. But like I'm not the guy that's going to pay for a tournament and not show up. That so. is uh, – yeah, that's a whole other conversation I need to have at some point. That's a weird-ass thing to where it's like just pay and you can go. You don't have to fish. It's like I don't know how I feel about that. But – um. But I just feel like it worked out. Like, I would have never picked the Shenandoah, and now it's like, all right, I won one. So now, like, let me get out of my comfort zone, go fish some Tidal Rivers and Smith, and, like, see how I how I do there. Just, like, going – I'm going to take – I'm going to use all my vacation to practice before each event, you know, a couple of days, and just see how it works out. It, it really does. You need that one win to really solidify what you're doing works and to give confidence in yourself um, to be able to go to that next step. It's so important to have that. And, uh, I mean, it's going to be a challenge. Like like I said, I hadn't been. Uh, I've been to the James once, so that deal is like, you know, I don't know if I'll stay in the river and run the tide in June or just like, go to the chick with a hundred other boats and just fish through all the tides. Like, but I'll cross that bridge when I get there. I got Smith coming up, you know, April 15th. So that'll be a slug fest. I'm going to try to get up there. Maybe the, what scares me there? Like, I don't know. I heard Smith was like a little behind as far as water temperature and stuff from what I'm used to. Um, I just feel like there's probably going to be fish on bed or am I wrong? Yeah, I think, I think they're going to be fish on beds. Uh, th- that's definitely going to happen in April. I mean, at least from the, at yeah, least see, from what I'd, I'm seeing. I'd rather fish for, uh, gotcha. Yeah. I'd rather fish for pre-spawners if possible, but, um, uh, like I said, I'm going to try to get up there a few times before that tournament and kind of see if I can get a feel for what's going on. What's so interesting, and with with the Bass Opens coming to Kerr, what kind of weights do you think the, those guys are going to be able to bring out of Kerr itself? Do you think it's going to have a good showing or a bad showing? May is so, like, hit or miss, at least for me, and I feel like the weights can be too. Um you know, I think if a guy can catch 16, 17 pounds a day, he's going to be in good shape. Um, and it's all going to kind of depend on how the rest of the spring plays out and the weather, obviously. But, like, that time of year, you can have so much going on. Like, you'll have fish on bed. You'll have probably a shad spawn and – just a lot of different things still still gonna be pre-spawn fish post-spawn fish i mean a guy can a guy can be looking at them catching them and you could probably have a guy catch them out of brush piles like so i guess it's kind of wait and see like i think a guy that can have multiple things going on to last for three days or whatever it is uh could win but yeah i mean i think you'll see some good weights in that one what do you think the weights are you had to be a betting man what do you think the top three weights are? The the bass opens. That's a three day deal, right? Yes, sir. 
I mean, I think somebody could bust a big bag like one day, like 19, 20 pounds, but I don't think you can back it up with more than 15 or 16 if I had to guess. So three days, I'll say probably 45 to 50 pounds. I'll say like 48 and change. Wow. Okay. 48. I'm hoping that this place turns around. I, w- I mean, I, I don't know. Part of me wants them to have an insane showing and maybe crack 50 ish something just so that they, it highlights how good of a fishery this is and what it, it it's better than it used to be by far. It, it really is. And I think it's turning around here. It is. And I may be lowballing. I may be lowballing it. I just, I don't know. This is a hard lake for a guy to like be that consistent for three days in a row. Like, a lot of two-day events, you can see guys in the fall win with, like, 32 to 34. And, I mean, that's a tough time of year. Um, but, yeah, to do it for three days is tough with that much pressure out here. Is that is Nutbush basically like the Chickahominy Creek of, the, of, of Kerr, where it just gets so much publicity? Yeah, it's definitely popular. And, like, most of your big tournaments are running out of there. So, I mean, I know the Opens, I, I, actually, I think they're going out of Clarksville. But, yeah, I mean, Nutbush is just so popular because it's like a lake in itself. Like, there's so many different creek arms within Nutbush. And I think that's why I try to avoid it a lot of times. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of tournaments won down there. But I don't know. It's just definitely, like, probably, like you said, like the Chickahominy of, of bugs. That and, like, if you go up the lake, like Grassy Creek, everybody loves Grassy Creek yeah it's weird because like I, all that's where all if you google online to try to get a fishing report of this place all they do is talk about nut bush and i think that's going to be interesting looking at it if you're a bass open guy or when the big tournament comes here i'm fascinated to watch where people go and how they get dispersed throughout this lake just to see how they kind of tackle it um uh, so you know mm-hmm. I try to ask everyone this and it usually ask what their dream is this year, but it sounds like you already just did it winning the tournament, but you have any other goals this year? I mean, you know, I like to set the bar high. Like if I'm going to finish this division out, like I was like, why not make a goal to win AOI in the division and like be fishing a bunch of fisheries I haven't been to. Like there would be nothing better than that to me. That's a pretty good goal. And hey, I mean, the hardest part is now over. You got the win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and another one obviously would be to go to the regional and, and finish in the top six. But uh, where's the regional? I'm gonna work my butt off when I get down to Norman to do. Is it Norman? Norman. Norman. Okay. That'd be way easier than fishing Kerr, though. Yeah. I mean, it's weird. Like, I haven't been to Norman. Um, I know a lot of people that live there and that have been there, but uh, I know October can be a hodgepodge of things. You know, you could be fishing piles one minute and then be running the bank with a walking bait or a whopper plopper five minutes later. So, I mean, I think it'll fit me well, honestly. Well, if you win that tournament, dude, you're more than welcome to come back on and talk about that too. Uh, At that point, I would hopefully be seeing you in the Bass Opens next. Maybe. Yeah, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but um, (laughs) hopefully, even if I can just, you know, have a strong finish in, you know, a handful of these other qualifiers in Shenandoah, um, I'd be thrilled. So kind of see what happens. I'm glad it kind of worked out because I don't think I would have done this if I wouldn't have won this first tournament. So. And, and hopefully this is the start of something awesome. Uh, you know, Bryson, thank you. You know, I don't want to keep you all night, but thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, is there any sponsors that you would like to plug or anyone you would like to give a shout out to? Uh, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, uh, JB Custom Rods. They're awesome rods, custom building done North Carolina. Uh, definitely check those out. Uh, True South Jigs. Um, and I will throw out my buddy, uh, Shallow Water Company. He uh, started a, a clothing line. Um, big, like, I do a lot of duck hunting, too. So, um, yeah, he's just trying to grow his brand, and he's doing pretty well. So, 
and then obviously all my tournament partners, my friends, family that support me. And, uh, you know, sometimes people think you're crazy because this is all you do and it con consumes your weekends and whatever else. But I know I have a lot of support from people. So just thanks to everybody. No, I mean, it is all consuming to your life, your bank account, every, like we all get that, but it's so cool when it all comes together and pays off like this. Thank you so much, Bryson. And again, guys, like always, link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, JB Custom Roz, his friends, Camo, Duck Company, all that's going to be in the episode description so you can check them out, uh, including uh, Bryson's social media. Please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us with the algorithm. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.